and I mean, everyone is playing Elden Ring now, uh, and that's not following any of the rules of open world games, and everyone's loving it. Um, and I'm playing it as well, and I was like, oh, this is the open world game that I wanted to play, uh, <laughs> and I didn't know it. Hello, uh, my name is David Fernandez Huerta, and I was the creative director of Alba, a wildlife adventure. Hello, my name is Lucas Gulbo. I'm a co-founder uh, at Something We Made, and I was also the uh, artist for the game Toem. Well, thank you very much, guys, for joining me. We are here for a BAFTA Games session. So we're with our two nominees for our awesome games, Alba, A Wildlife Adventure, and Tome. And we're here to discuss mindful gaming. So our two titles here are uh, very, very chill, very fun. What was the thinking behind making the game? We started prototyping new games after Morning Valley 2, uh, and we had this really cool game idea that was uh, some of like a time traveling puzzle game and it was really complicated and i was really stressing about it and and it's like i just want and i take i love walking around in nature and taking pictures of animals and, and I, I do that whenever i have the chance and i was like oh i wish i could just make a game about just having a chill walk in the park that's amazing you just took your inspiration from what you enjoyed and, and made <laughs> it into a game <laughs> i sort of have the similar way of uh, going about finding ideas i just like i had traveled a bit with a bus a lot to my parents back and forth and going out with the dog and stuff so i was like oh let's just make a game where you travel in sweden um and then we started to experiment a bit with changing uh, perspective back and forth so you went from like a top-down view to like a first person one and it's like oh we should make a camera game um so that's kind of like how it initially started and uh, so one theme more sensing from both of you guys is kind of trying to take real life and put it into to your video games right it's kind of make an experience that you might have in real life anyways but but translate it to the digital sphere so is that something that was quite important to you Unlike film, you can take a camera and just put it in front of something and you have a film. But in games, you have to make everything, every single thing in front of the camera, you have to build yourself. And that naturally creates an opportunity for fantasy and weirdness because you have to build everything from scratch. Um, and that makes this kind of like relatable human experience games really rare because who would bother building something mundane when you can have anything um and i think that was something that you know we've missed or at least i've missed as a player um so we stripped it all back and and made it as relatable as possible and that was well i wouldn't call having a pandemic lucky but <laughs> it was coincidental that when no one could leave their houses we were making a game about being out in the open and running around in the in the countryside and that was really nice and nowadays there's a lot of pressure for games to be these big you know giant sprawling things that can appeal to as many people as they can how do you view the current climate of gaming um, I, I think there's there's this place with games just like with uh, movies and um, tv series where there's um, usually different types of scenarios where you can actually put the games in so like there can be long games like a tv show that's like fifth five seasons um but there's also these short movies that people still enjoy um so i think games should uh, probably uh, be applied in the same space like there can be short games they can be long games like i used to say i don't know like 10 years ago i would pay more for these games to be shorter <laughs> that much time uh, and, you know, over the last 10, 15 years, the games industry has changed a lot in, in what it offers to players. And I still go and play these big, great looking games. And I'm like, kind of like yearning for something a little bit different. And I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm still playing them. <laughs> uh, so it, it's clearly an allure. There's, there's clearly something that is cool about them. Um, but yeah, I feel super lucky that, that we, you know, have this this variety of, of games now and you can switch from bigger games and smaller games. Do you feel like uh, the, the sort of the bigger games are a bit more formulaic? I think to an extent, like when you have to put so much money into a product, you kind of like have to 
make some safe bets uh, and then and then kind of like expand on uh, or, or innovate in, in certain areas. And I mean, everyone is playing Elden Ring now uh, and that's not following any of the rules of open world games and everyone's loving it. Um, and I'm playing it as well. And I was like, oh, this is the open world game that I wanted to play uh, <laughs> and I didn't know it. Um, so th there's certainly, you know, room for like breaking the formula, but I think it's, you know, when you have to spend, you know, 500 million pounds on a product, like, I, you can't blame them. I, I think I haven't played a lot of games. It feels like the more games I make, the, the less games I play. Same. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, when, when I jumped into, I think the last game I played was Ghost of Tsushima. Um, and it felt like, like I didn't really have to think about, like, how to play it, because it just kind of worked i guess <laughs> and every game comes with a photo mode now and i was like i was playing one of the assassin's creed the one in egypt and i was like i was having a great time but i was mainly taking pictures of the beautiful <laughs> landscapes in the game it was like there is a game in here yeah. um, um I, I don't need you know the intrigue and i don't need the you know all the combat and stuff like i mean i will still play i play like 150 hours of that game but i will i wouldn't make it but both your games have this you know camera camera lens uh, dynamic so what what made you choose that in particular for us it was um yeah i think i mentioned it before but yeah it was just a, a coincidence um in the very first version of toem which we didn't know what to do with it um we put in a lot of ideas from whatever and uh, i think there was like this telescope thing that you were supposed to look at the stars with um which changed the perspective and we kind of took that and just like oh well maybe you can take a photo and then have someone react to it let's try that and then we just i think nicholas made like <laughs> he, he he cheated uh it wasn't working at all uh, it was just like he took a picture and then he hit the the magic keyboard uh, button and uh, he reacted to the photo and we were like, okay, well, this is, this is kind of fun to have small characters just say how weird your photo looks or how beautiful it is. It's a hobby of mine to take pictures of animals in real life. And, you know, my dad has always had a camera. And when he got, uh, eventually when he got a new camera, when I was a teenager, he gave me his old camera and I started taking my own pictures and be, I've always been interested in wildlife and I just like you know had it in the back of my mind in, in those terms and I remember about probably about 10 years ago that I was playing Diablo 3 and I was like oh this will be a great thing if instead of combat you were like just looking around for like animals like I love the exploration but and I've played again <laughs> too many hours of that game um, but you know like I'm always looking for like different different um, how to say it, different interpretations of what action means. So action doesn't need to be combat and it doesn't need to be winning a fight with an enemy. It can be a chase or it can be, you know, getting around your target and finding the right angle in the case of photography. So I, I had that in the back of my mind for a while. People like and understand taking pictures. There's, there's something of inherent value to humans with capturing something with a camera and keeping it. Um, and I love collecting. And it's, it's just like the, all these many things, like collecting birds, but not like in Pokemon that you're actually kidnapping animals and forcing them to fight for you, but <laughs> just like appreciating them and, and helping the world understand that this, this biodiversity there for everyone to enjoy and that we need to keep it um, healthy. It's like, where did you you know, draw, draw your creative inspiration from most of it just was, um, random pieces of games that we played over the years. Uh, I really like Zelda and all like my favorite part about Zelda is like sub quests for some reason. I don't know why, but I just like finding something and then running back, giving it and getting rupees. And it's <laughs> just like, yeah, I helped someone. <laughs> it doesn't, doesn't make any sense, but, um, and I think a lot of poem in general is just sub quest it's a bunch of like hey i i my stomach hurt or, or hurt or just like 
oh, I need bread so I can feed birds. And then you need to figure out how to get bread. Uh, yeah, we're, we're, you know, we're like six people in total, I think. Yeah. That all like share goofy ideas with each other. Uh, that about having goofy ideas and that, I think that is actually something that smaller games have so much of an advantage with bigger games that we can use comedy and levity and have fun with things in a way that for some reason, big <laughs> games can't do comedy or don't want to do comedy. And comedy is a mainstream genre on television and cinema, <laughs> but games that seem to have, when I was a kid, there was like all the LucasArts adventure games and they were written in a really funny way. And like, there's lots of humor to them. Uh, but it seems that we've lost that along the way uh, on the bigger games. That's funny. How do you, you know, when you're developing a chill game or a game that you want to make be a bit more wholesome, how do you kind of measure that? Is there like a metric? I, I always had in mind that thing of like, you can't be, you can't be holding the player by the hand all the time. Like you have to let go. And we tried many things. We tried, um, not giving quests to players. So they will have to go and talk to characters to get the quests and people didn't know what to do. So it wasn't chill, it was really stressful. Um, and we tried having three different quests active at the same time and people didn't know what to do, didn't know what was important. Um, so what we ended up with was you, you always have one main quest, but this, oh, that quest is always sufficiently far away from you that you're going to encounter things along the way. Having this idea of the game is a side quest, like it's all side quests. And like, we just like, we tell you there's a main quest and we give you like all sorts of different objectives that are not quantified. They are kind of quantified, but they, they're not, it's not um, forward facing in that way. It's not like asking you to do all these things. You do them because you know it, there are opportunities for play i think we very early on said that we wanted to make something with zero violence in it and i think that is one of the the things that drive it because you can't really i mean you 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 can't really make a game <laughs> that has violence in it and be chill i guess uh it sounds weird mm. in my head yeah uh might be possible uh, uh but then as we you know, as we started making more and more things that uh, others could actually look at and play, um, we got contacted with uh, Launchable Socks and Jamal Green, which are both great composers. <laughs> and they really set the whole tone. And then, you know, they got inspired by our work. We were inspired by their work. So it's a constant back and forth of just making things that feel very relaxing. Um, and then one of the, I guess it's a core pillar of Toa was we wanted to make a game where you stop and smell the flowers. So you wouldn't have to um, feel like everything you do is a must. It's more like, hey, you can actually complete this area even if you haven't 100%ed it. Um, and I think just pushing the whole um, driven aspect of that Right, you're trying to remove the feeling that the player feels forced to do anything to really allow them to explore. Yeah, one thing we did, uh, speaking of time, we, we used to have the time of day moving constantly. And that will, by definition, create a sense of urgency. And also, you're playing a child, so it didn't make sense that you're walking around this island in the middle of the night and, and all that. Um, and we tried a bunch of things and uh, what we ended up doing is the time of day, the time of day is frozen between quests. So when you complete a main quest, the time of day progresses and they broken up in, in different, in, in, you know, similar, uh, length. So you feel like if you don't know, you don't really notice because you see the time of day changing, uh, and it's based on the story, but um, you know, it's not forcing you to, to move. And one thing that we also had is that at the end of the day, we used to have grandpa coming to pick you up. 
So the moment you saw the pink sky, it was like, oh, I need to take as many pictures as I can now because the sunset is going to be just a few seconds until grandpa shows up. Um, and it took us a, some time, but like we said, like, we should just remove that. We should just, uh, so in the final game, what you get is a text message from granddad saying, hey, come to the house to have dinner. And you can spend as long as you want in this eternal golden hour. I think, uh, I mean, which kid doesn't doesn't love the idea of just staying out forever in this eternal yeah. eternal evening? But also really nice that, you know, your exploration, you know, the, the solution you chose, your exploration doesn't come at the cost of like some resource right? that, you know, both your games have quite, I think, strong messages of you know, community service and harmonious living, I think, is, if that's fair to say, and this idea of kind of being a part of your community. So was that, you know, a message that you guys were keen to emphasize or did you just kind of come about? For us, it was more, um, I think it was, uh, we wanted to make sure that the player would actually interact with all the the, the folks in the, the different uh, areas. Um, so the way that you play now is that you, um, once you finish a quest, you get a stamp on a like a community card, which is basically just a a, um, a bus card. Um, so after you get on a, a few stamps, you can take the bus, uh, and they kind of tied in nicely with the the thing that we really wanted to do, which is like have the player talk to a bunch of NPCs, um, get different sort of quests, and what do they all NPCs have in common? They're all in a community. And yeah, so I, I, that thing was um, the way that led into it. Where do you see the future of kind of chill and mindful gaming, both on a personal level and maybe just across the industry? I think I think there's been a, a pretty big explosion just over the past couple of years of games that, yeah, it doesn't use you know, in, for example, combat to solve problems. Um, and I, I guess it shows just how how many different ways there are to still use games um, to express certain things and that there are still like ideas that we haven't you know tried uh, enough when journey came out and suddenly people realized like oh it doesn't have to be a power fantasy it doesn't have to be about you overcoming your enemies because it and, and remember also when i uh, when the first bioshock came out and people said like i really love it but i wish there was a version that didn't have combat because I was just, I just want to explore this world and find out about these characters. And, um, and I've, you know, like we, we, gaming as a, well, video games as a medium is mature enough now that there has been a, maybe like three generations of creators now that, you know, I've grown up with games made by people who grew up with, so games as well like we, we and the new people making games now they've played you know like some people are like oh it was because of morning valley that i wanted to make games and like uh, <laughs> so old um but you know like it, everything is kind of like um every new generation of game makers you know removes things from the equation and adds new things and 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 takes all games, and that's I think why we see so many uh, twists on on classic formulas, and and I think like again talking about Elden Ring, it has a, a, a lot in common with the very first Zelda on the NES. That is a big world, and there you go, like explore it and and figure it out. We're not gonna tell you anything, uh, and if you bump into a character that tells you something you better remember what they said because we're not going to remind you um and it's kind of like taking that same philosophy and like adapting it to modern days yeah here's for the future <laughs> <laughs> here's for the future woo indeed no thank you so much guys for your time it's been it's thank been an awesome chance it. to talk that to you and thank you for producing these awesome games uh best of luck in the awards